Aloha, my name is Dr. Sean Moss. I'm the Executive Director at Oceanic Institute of Hawaii Pacific University. Did you know that shrimp are the most popular seafood consumed in the United States? The average American eats more than four and a half pounds of shrimp per year. What you may not know is that most shrimp we eat do not come from the ocean. They're not wild caught. Most of the shrimp we eat come from Asia and Latin America in shrimp ponds. Shrimp aquaculture represents an important component of the global aquaculture industry. And this industry represents the fastest growing sector of agriculture worldwide. More than 50% of the seafood consumed globally comes from aquaculture. Now, if we look at the list of the top five seafood items consumed in the United States, we see that shrimp are listed at number one, salmon at number two, and tilapia at number five. All three of these species are important in the global aquaculture industry. Canned tuna at number three and Alaskan pollock at number four are both caught from the wild. Now, in addition to being key species in the aquaculture industry, farm shrimp, Atlantic salmon, and tilapia all have another very important characteristic in common. They're all associated with selective breeding programs designed to improve things like fast growth, survival, and disease resistance. It is because of selective breeding that these species can be produced relatively cheaply now, and selective breeding has helped catalyze their ascent to the top of our seafood list. If we look at other food production systems, we shouldn't be surprised at the role domestication and selective breeding have played on our food choices. According to the United Nations, about 75% of our calories come from just 12 plants and five animals. When we look at plant agriculture, we see that corn, rice, and wheat represent about 50% of our plant-derived calories. And if we consider animal agriculture, pork, chicken, and beef represent more than 90% of the meat we eat globally. So why do we eat so few species of plants and animals today? Well, the answer is explained in large part to domestication and selective breeding. Selective breeding began about 10,000 years ago when hunter-gatherers began tending flocks of birds and herding animals, and, and they began cultivating cereals and other plants. And these practices continued, continued for millennia. Now, up until the early 1900s, animal breeding was regarded more of an art than a science. But over the past 60 years, modern breeding techniques and molecular genetic tools have accelerated progress in improving commercially important traits of the animals that we eat. One vivid example of this is from the broiler chicken industry. Largely through selective breeding, the chickens that we eat today grow twice as fast on half the amount of feed as the chickens of 60 years ago. And while some of this improvement is due to better animal husbandry and improved diets, it was selective breeding that really moved the needle on improving production efficiencies in the broiler industry. The power of selective breeding is illustrated in this photo of the three chickens. The chicken on the left is a breed that was developed in 1957, the chicken in the middle from 1978, and the chicken on the right was developed in 2005. Now, all three of these chickens were raised under identical conditions and were photographed at the same age. You can clearly see differences in the size and shape of these three different ch chicken breeds. In the 1990s, uh, or I'm sorry, the 1970s, Norwegian salmon farmers borrowed a page from the poultry breeders playbook and applied selective breeding techniques to Atlantic salmon with tremendous success. They found, for example, that growth rates of salmon more than doubled after just five generations of selection. This degree, this magnitude of rapid improvement could only be achieved through selective breeding and the application of selective breeding techniques helped catalyze the salmon industry uh, into a world leader. Now more than 70% of the world salmon comes from aquaculture and this industry is valued at more than $10 billion today. Now, early achievements by salmon farmers highlighted something very important to the aquaculture industry, that aquatic animals possess characteristics which are amenable to selective breeding. For example, aquatic animals typically exhibit high fecundity, that is a single 
female salmon or shrimp or female oyster can produce thousands to millions of eggs per spawn rather than producing just a small handful. And this abundance of gametes with its inherent genetic variability is the raw material upon which selection acts. Aquatic animals also reach sexual maturity at a relatively young age, months to a few years rather than years to decades. So generation time or generation interval is relatively short and a breeder can make improvements in commercially important traits relatively quickly. These characteristics make aquatic animals excellent candidates for selection. Now, in the early 1990s, researchers at the Oceanic Institute here in Hawaii invited a renowned salmon breeder to visit to help apply and adapt their fish breeding strategies to the culture of marine shrimp. And using these strategies, we developed the world's first family-based shrimp breeding program. And we not only accelerated shrimp growth rates significantly after just a few generations of selection, we also improved pond survival, and we developed lines of shrimp that were resistant to specific viral pathogens. Interestingly, and, and quite frankly, inadvertently, we also created a more docile shrimp. Back in the early 1990s, we stocked our ponds at about 50 shrimp per square meter. Roughly every three foot by three foot square, we cultured 50 shrimp in that area. If we stocked at a higher density, that is if we tried to cram in more shrimp, the shrimp would get skittish and jump out of the pond, literally onto the berm of the pond. Well, over time and with selective breeding, we can now stock our ponds at over 800 shrimp per square meter. And I can go swimming in the pond without the shrimp even noticing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing transformation. Back in 1990, we produced about a pound of shrimp per square meter of pond area. Now we can produce over 20 pounds in the same area. 20 times more shrimp in the same pond area, the powers of selective breeding and the powers of domestication at play. Today, almost all of the world's farm shrimp come from selective breeding programs, and many of these shrimp can trace their genetic ancestry back here to Hawaii. In today's world, shrimp farmers simply can't grow a wild shrimp anymore because they wouldn't be cost competitive. Now, despite the compelling evidence for the power of selective breeding, and despite the fact that several commercially important species like Atlantic salmon and farm shrimp are almost entirely dependent on genetically improved stocks, the global aquaculture industry as a whole still rely heavily on what are essentially wild animals. There are more than 400 different species of aquatic animals, plants, and algae farmed worldwide. Yet there are selective breeding programs for only about 25 of these species. Today, only about 15% of the global aquaculture industry comes from selectively bred animals, and the, the, the remainder are essentially wild types. The reasons for the low number of aquaculture breeding programs are varied and include uh, cost and complexity to run the programs. But despite these challenges, Despite these challenges, it's becoming increasingly important for the global aquaculture industry as a critically important food production system to pivot more from an art to a science, to move from culturing wild animals to culturing selectively bred animals. This pivot will enhance aquaculture sustainability in significant ways, and this imperative is only growing in the context of global climate change. By now, we're all familiar with the prognostications of living on a warmer planet. On land, we'll see an increase in extreme weather events resulting in more destructive hurricanes, as well as more severe droughts in some places and more severe rainfall in others. And these events could lead to localized food and water shortages, catalyzing a mass migration of people. In the oceans and along our coast, we'll see warmer waters with lower oxygen levels an increase in harmful algal blooms, and an increase in sea level rise and ocean acidification. And we're already seeing the impacts of these changes as warmer waters are forcing fish to abandon their traditional habitats and move to cooler waters. Clearly, global climate change will have a profoundly negative impact on our food production systems, including the global aquaculture industry. 
okay, so how do we as an aquaculture industry begin to tackle the important challenges of global climate change? And to what extent will selective breeding and other genetic improvement strategies play in providing solutions to these challenges? Well, many aqua farmers around the world conduct their business along the coast from shrimp farmers in Indonesia to oyster farmers in the Pacific Northwest to traditional Hawaiian fish pond operators here in Hawaii. Coastal areas are often the location of choice for aquatic food production. However, it's these valuable coastal areas that are most vulnerable to climate change. And we see this vulnerability when king tides crash against the rock walls protecting our local ia, our fish ponds here in Hilo or here in Kaneohe, or when we hear about the unusually high mortality events of baby oysters in Washington state due to the dissolution of their thin shells from an acidic ocean. As we envision an aquaculture industry of the future, we need to consider carefully moving some of our production systems away from these sensitive coastal areas. We need to consider carefully expanding the role of inland aquaculture using recirculating technologies and moving some of our systems to offshore cage culture. If we do this, if we move away from the coast, selective breeding must play a more important role in aquatic food production than it does currently. And here's why. If we move aquaculture inland, if we culture our animals in indoor production systems, we can control the production environment. We can control water temperature and oxygen concentration, and we can exclude many pathogens from the production system by creating physical barriers and instituting proper biosecurity measures. Now, the downside, of course, is these systems are expensive to build and expensive to operate. And because of this, we need to optimize uh, production efficiencies to the maximum extent possible, including the use of animals that are genetically different from those that we grow along the coast. Here at Oceanic Institute, we've developed these indoor systems for marine shrimp, and we've customized some of our shrimp lines by putting selective pressure on those traits which maximize growth and survival under the unique conditions of an indoor system. Importantly, we no longer need to select the shrimp for viral resistance because we're able to exclude viral pathogens from the culture environment. Now, viral resistance is an important trait that shrimp breeders do select for currently because these pathogens continue to plague the shrimp farmers along the coast to the tune of billions of dollars in crop loss a year. By growing shrimp in indoor biosecure systems, we're able to exclude viral resistance from our breeding strategy and focus more on system relevant traits for more rapid genetic gain. If indoor systems are to be successful, they'll require animals which are fundamentally genetically different than their coastal counterparts. We need to look at this if these systems are going to be more cost effective. Now, we can also move aquaculture offshore to cages to get away from vulnerable coastal areas. However, the water quality in these cages will be nearly identical to ambient conditions in terms of, of temperature and other parameters. In offshore cages, we can't control the production environment very well. So breeders must create an animal that is genetically robust to handle environmental changes. Fortunately, shrimp and fish breeders can in fact select genotypes, the genetic makeup of fish to ensure good performance across a variety of environments and with resilience to environmental fluctuation. The challenge with offshore cage culture in the context of selective breeding is concern about the biological consequences of selectively bred animals escape from the cages and interbreed with wild stocks. This is a legitimate concern, but there are strategies to mitigate negative impacts of escapees, including the production of sterile fish for the cages. Now, looking forward, we really need to rethink the risk and reevaluate the cost benefit analysis of relegating offshore cage culture to the use of wild fish only. This would be a huge handicap to that sector of the aquaculture industry because offshore farmers would not be able to benefit from the powerful advantages of using selectively bred animals. 
What is clear is that as we adapt to living on a warmer planet, we need to develop more effective ways to produce aquatic protein. The production of aquatic animals and plants is inherently more sustainable than the production of their terrestrial counterparts. And aquatic animals have been shown to be excellent candidates for selection. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the hugely impactful role that genetic tools, modern genetic tools will have on improving the phenotypes of our aquacultured animals and plants. And some of these tools are being used in important ways today. However, breeding programs and the integration of molecular tools is expensive. So public and private investment will be needed to support these initiatives. But as a famous management expert and economist once said, aquaculture, not the internet, represents the most promising investment opportunity of the 21st century. Mahalo and aloha, thank you.